our grand rounds this morning is on uh, controversies in the management of metastatic disease. And we're going to start out uh, with uh, Josh Lindsay, one of our chief residents, who's going to introduce the topic. And from there, we'll move on to Darren Davidson, uh, one of our assistant professors who specializes in cancer surgery. Darren is going to review issues that arise with treatment of humoral metastatic disease. And then uh, Chappie Conrad, our chief of the sarcoma service and chief at Children's Hospital, is going to finish up discussing uh, issues of management of femoral metastatic disease. Thank you, Dr. Shansky. So the objectives today are to discuss the current issues uh, in management of metastatic bone disease. This will be broken down into three separate sections. One's the basic principles of management of metastatic disease. And then Dr. Uh, Davidson will talk about humoral metastatic disease. And Dr. Conrad will talk about femoral metastatic disease. Just an introductory case before we get started. Uh, it's a 45-year-old female with a history of metastatic breast cancer, and she presents with right arm pain. These are AP and lateral views of her humerus. She has a lytic lesion in her distal third of her humeral shaft. Her pain is unresponsive to palliative uh, uh, radiation therapy. She's undergone a trial of bracing, uh, and she's coming back because it's been ineffective. And different treatment options that we'll discuss today include continued non-operative treatment, um, excision and endoprosthetic reconstruction, uh, intramedullary uh, nailing of her uh, humerus, or a cement uh, plate reconstruction. So just the basics of principles of management of metastatic bone disease. There's over a million new cases of cancer diagnosed each year. 50% of those patients will have expected bone metastases. Uh, there's improved cancer treatment uh, and survival has increased for patients. Therefore, the prevalence of bone metastases is, is on the rise. And in a patient greater than 40 years of age, um, metastasis is far more common than a primary bone lesion. There's essentially two basic clinical scenarios of a patient who presents with a metastatic lesion. The first is a patient who has known metastatic disease, and they're presenting to you with a uh, new location of a metastasis or expansion of an existing metastasis. Uh, and in that scenario, you treat the lesion. Uh, the second scenario is a patient who presents um, without the existing uh, metastatic diagnosis. Uh, in this, they may have a remote history of cancer, but not a current diagnosis of metastasis. Uh, and you need to do local and systemic uh, staging as necessary. So staging of the disease, local staging include x-rays of the entire bone, uh, CT and plus minus MRI, depending on uh, what your clinical suspicion is and biopsy. And staging includes CT of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, bone scan, and blood work. So most common primary malignancies that metastasize the bone are listed here. They include uh, breast, lung, prostate, renal, myeloma, and lymphoma. So there's three different treatment options. Of course, there's chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and surgery. There are some tumors that are uh, very sensitive to chemotherapy and radiation therapy, uh, in particular lymphoma, myeloma, and breast metastasis, and surgery may not be necessary. This is just an example of a patient with a B-cell lymphoma uh, involving his left ileum at the time of uh, presentation. And this is halfway through his chemotherapy and radiation therapy with uh, some resolution of his cortices. This is a slide discussing the special circumstances of renal cell. Uh, there's a paper in uh, JBGS in 2007 that looked at uh, renal cell metastasis uh, in patients who present with the solitary metastasis. It may be um, beneficial to the patient to actually have the lesion excised as opposed to undergoing prophylactic treatment just because um, the survival at five years with a solitary lesion could be 35%. So it may be uh, in a renal cell, it's a, it's a different scenario if they have that as a known diagnosis. Clinical difficulties in treating patients who have metastases, um, it's hard to differentiate whether their pain is related to cancer and cancer pain or if it's uh, an issue with structure and mechanical pain. There's always the concern for an impending pathologic fracture. And then the occasional patient who presents with this destructive lesion with an unknown diagnosis. Cancer-related pain is typically constant. It's not affected by use uh, of the limb or loading of the affected bone. It's usually responsive to non-operative modalities such as radiation therapy and analgesics. And then mechanical pain is typically uh, pre present when people are using their affected limb. And it's a structural issue requiring a structural solution. Uh, this is one of the more well-known studies uh, by Dr. Murrells. Uh, what he attempted to do was uh, develop a scoring system uh, to uh, quantify a number uh, for patients who have a metastatic lesion and determine whether or not they need to have prophylactic fixation uh, for their impending pathologic fracture. 
He assigned a score of one, two, and three to four different criteria, including sight, uh, nature, size, and pain, with the highest score being uh, in the peritrochanteric region, a lytic lesion larger than two-thirds of the diameter of the bone, and functional pain. This is just an example of that scoring system and how it's used. This is a patient with a large lytic lesion of the of proximal femur. Location is a, is a three because it's peritrochanteric. Pain is uh, functional, so the patient got a three. Size is two, as is between one-thirds and two-thirds of the, of the width of the diameter of the cortices. Uh, and it's a uh, lytic lesion, so it's a type three. So with Dr. Merrill's classification, he gets a score of 11, and therefore it's greater than nine. And, uh, it's recommended the patient undergo prophylactic fixation. This study was then followed up with a subsequent study where basically 53 reviewers uh, evaluated 12 known cases with uh, known outcomes. And the important uh, component of this study was that there was good inter-observer agreement for uh, the site of the lesion, whether or not it warranted fixation, uh, and less so for the size. Um, it had a high sensitivity but low specificity. And based upon this paper, it demonstrated that Merrill's criteria was more accurate in predicting uh, risk for fracture than clinical judgment. And this is another study, uh, very similar, but basically looked at the inter and intra observer reliability of the murals criteria, which was uh, between moderate and good. Uh, this patient here is a, a different example. This is a patient who presented with a solitary destructive bone lesion, and this needs to be presumed to be a sarcoma until proven otherwise, uh, even with a history of a prior cancer diagnosis. And you need to do a prudent workup, and a tissue diagnosis is essential, even in the setting of a destructive fracture. So in introduction, the goals of surgical management are the, are the following. Uh, stabilization of the fracture, preservation of bone stock, maximize the quality of life, one surgery uh, per bone, and immediate use of the extremity. And the recovery should be uh, shorter than the anticipated survival. Next, Dr. Davidson is going to talk about the management of humeral lesions. So we're going to go through some aspects related to actually managing the metastatic lesions in the humerus, and then talk about the femur. And we have some cases at the end that hopefully will generate some discussion about management of these difficult problems. By way of introduction, the humerus is the second most commonly affected long bone with metastatic disease, the first being the femur. And both impending as well as actual pathologic fractures can be a significant source of morbidity for these patients. And though non-operative treatment methods are usually the first line of management, the response can be unpredictable. And as with all aspects of metastatic bone disease, the primary goal has to be maximization of quality of life. There are a few surgical options that we have. There's cement plate fixation, there's intramedullary nail fixation, and then there's also excising the lesion and reconstructing it with some form of a prosthetic device. Cement plate fixation um, is maybe the newer kid on the block in a sense, and this involves an open procedure to address the lesion itself, curette the lesion out, place cement, and then a plate uh, fixation over top of that, and then adjuvant radiation. And these x-rays just demonstrate pre- and post-operative views of a lesion in the proximal humeral diaphysis. There are several advantages uh, to this technique. One is that it avoids rotator cuff damage and nail prominence. It provides better fixation in poor bone as a result of the metastatic disease. But perhaps most importantly is that it actually will address the tumor. It'll reduce tumor burden, which will lead to a lower prevalence of tumor progression. And this is actually an important issue dating back in the literature as far as about 20 years in a study predominantly of intramedullary nail fixation, where a local disease progression occurred in a third of patients, and a quarter of patients had actual fixation failure requiring revision surgery. And this becomes important when we're trying to achieve one operation per bone. Disadvantage, it's a much bigger operation than placement of an IM nail. Leading into the next option, intramedullary nail fixation. So the standard ways would be done for a traumatic fracture. This can be done either with or without placement of cement at the location of the metastasis, and then adjuvant radiation treatment for local control. Other option is actually excising the lesion, either if it's in the proximal humerus or the distal humerus, and doing a prosthetic reconstruction. The x-ray on the left shows a humeral hemiarthroplasty for management of a proximal humeral lesion and then on the right, a bigger tumor-type prosthesis for a distal humeral lesion. And these also, depending on the manner in which the excision is done, consideration for adjuvant radiation uh, can be given. So it'd be nice if we could compare the results of all of these different treatment options and come up with an evidence-based type of 
algorithm for decision making. Unfortunately, that's not the case. For the different modalities, we all have small series typically of each, and it's very difficult to compare the results because the outcomes that are used in the studies are different, but almost more problematic is that different patient populations are used, and I'll outline this going through some studies, and this particularly relates to the patient's survival from their primary disease. So starting with cement plate fixation, a recent study, which is the largest of this particular technique, 63 patients, three quarters of them had an actual pathologic fracture. Comparing the complication rates to other series, which are predominantly of IM nail fixation, the rate is similar. At the time of most recent follow-up, which is just over six years postoperatively, patients seem to be doing pretty well. Almost 90% have minimal, if any, pain. Two-thirds have independent ADLs. And this survival curve shows a cumulative probability of death on the top curve and revision surgery on the lower curve. The lower curve is important. It shows there's not a whole lot of revisions done, so that's accomplishing our goal of one operation per bone. And then the curve on the top representing patient survival is what you'd expect given it's a population of metastatic bone disease. And in this study, it's important to note at six months, 61% survival, at one year, 42%. And that becomes important when we try to compare the results across studies, looking at what the patient overall survival was. This is a recent study of intramedullary nail fixation, similar in that three quarters of the patients had actually fractured. Also very good uh, results as far as pain relief and function are concerned. They didn't have any fixation failures, which sounds great, but when then you look at the patient population, you see that the overall mean survival is only seven months. So though they didn't report their survival in terms of cumulative probabilities, and you can't directly compare it, their population is probably a group that didn't survive as long, so they're not at risk of fixation failure for the same length of time as a previous study. And so it's hard to say that there aren't fixation failures over the longer haul, particularly when patients are starting to survive longer with metastatic disease as treatments are improving. This is the largest series uh, in the literature that we could find, 214 lesions. The majority had actually fractured. The overall survival in this group was similar to that cement plate paper with 40% survival at one year. But the nice thing that this paper did is it broke down the results by the location of the lesions. So you've got the proximal, the mid shaft, and the distal lesions. For the proximal lesions, you can see there's a rough split between intramedullary nail versus some form of arthroplasty being used for reconstruction. The diaphyseal lesions almost entirely were treated with an IM nail, and distally mostly with plate fixation. And the proximal and distal uh, lesions had a very low uh, revision rate, 7%, 8%. The distal lesion is much higher, 33% failed and required revision, and that may be an indication of either the location is more difficult to deal with or the fact that they're mostly done with a plate. This is a case example from, from that paper where they show a distal lesion on uh, the x-ray labeled A, uh, very distal lesion, large lesion involving the metaphysis and epiphysis. B is their immediate postoperative film where, you know, maybe with the uh, benefit of hindsight or a critical eye, you can look at and say, well, there's not a lot of cement there and the plate lengths are pretty short. And you can see what happened eventually. That construct failed and the patient required revision. This series from 2009 is really the only direct head-to-head -head comparison in the literature of cement plate fixation compared to intramedullary nail fixation in about 20 patients in each study. Looking at their table, you can see that in the intramedullary nail group, there's more issues related to tumor progression and lack of decreasing tumor burden with complications related to instability and tumor progression. On the cement plate side, it's radial nerve palsy that was the big issue. And difficult to directly compare these, though, because there's a big bias associated with how patients got their treatment. The IM nail patients typically were allocated to that treatment because their life expectancy was estimated to be less than three months. So then when you look at the proportion that developed local tumor progression or instability, that may be an underestimate of what it would be if those patients were surviving longer. Another recent study, this actually compares intramedullary nails placed with cement at the site of the lesion versus no cement. And at both one week and six weeks postoperatively, the functional scores as well as pain relief were better in the group treated with cement in addition to the nail. By six months, those differences had become uh, non-existent. And finally, a series looking at distal humeral lesions exclusively that were treated with excision of the metastatic lesion and prosthetic reconstruction. 
38 cases, and the important part to look at here is the proportion that had major complications. It's almost 20%, so all of those people are requiring repeat, or at least one repeat uh, procedure, and that's, again, a situation we're hoping to avoid by, by providing a treatment that has one operation per bone. And this is an example of one of the lesions in that study, large lesion in the distal metaphysis sneaking into the epiphysis, treated with excision and prosthetic reconstruction. So in summary, the humerus is a very common site of metastatic involvement. As patients survive longer and there are more patients with metastatic bone disease, the burden of disease of looking after patients with humeral metastases is only going to increase. The predominant options for stabilization are cement plate reconstruction and intramedullary nail. And it would be great to have evidence-based guidelines for this, but it's very difficult to compare the results across studies. That leaves us in a situation of having to discuss the relative advantages and disadvantages of those techniques with the patients and try to come to a decision that's going to suit that particular patient the best. For those reasons, we definitely need some comparative prospective studies so that we can hopefully have a better decision-making algorithm uh, in managing these patients. And we're going to leave cases of dealing with humeral metastases for after the next section on metastatic disease of the femur, which Dr. Conrad's going to review. Well, we picked this topic because it's an essential topic for your education and for your practice future. Uh, metastatic disease will be in your future, whether you're a sports surgeon or a total joint surgeon. And the basic essential, essentials of the topic are critical to uh, having a successful practice. We picked humerus and femur because they're the two most common. Spine and uh, pelvis are perhaps the more challenging locations. Uh, although I will add that the upper extremity uh, review that Darren just gave uh, of that topic, I think the distal humerus uh, is the most challenging site of all the extremity sites because of the uh, surgical options and limitations. While the femur might be the most common location, it has some of the most common techniques like a femoral rod or a total hip that allow you to reconstruct metastases in the femur and a lot of uh, good surgical options for femoral lesions. Again, the best way to approach femoral lesions is to approach them with the categorization of an anatomic proximal mid-shaft and, and distal femur. If we look at the proximal femur, those are lesions of the femoral neck versus lesions of the intertrochanteric level versus lesions involving the subtrochanteric area. Uh, certainly, uh, a hemiarthroplasty is the obvious option for fixation in a patient with metastatic adenocarcinoma or something similar involving the femoral neck, um, involving the intertrochanteric areas. And while the Morales categorization is a good way to approach that, I think a simple way to approach it is, is there a cortical defect? Is it at least a couple centimeters in size? Is it lytic? And is it painful? Are the basic indications for doing a procedure for most of these patients. The details of the diagnosis, the specific diagnosis, and the stage of the disease are critical determinants in making a decision about surgery for these patients. For the subtrochanteric area, uh, we begin to get into femoral rod territory with proximal fixation with interlocking femoral rods that is very efficient at taking care of those lesions. If a tumor is larger, if it's larger than five centimeters, I think five centimeters is a good rule for either the proximal femur or the distal femur because when you've uh, broached the five centimeter level, you've usually gotten into the subtrochanteric area from, if you measure from the greater trochanter. Those lesions that are larger, that have recurrent, that have failed radiation therapy, a particular renal cell cancer as a solitary metastasis is a good indication for resection up front for some of these patients and will in many cases avoid the need for radiation therapy, which is six weeks of treatment. And in a patient who's not doing that well, uh, avoiding six weeks of radiation therapy is an attractive alternative. And the implants for resections are uh, improved significantly in the, in the recent past uh, in terms of their effectiveness and function and recovery. Proximal femoral implants, if you make the decision, are obviously not the most common way to reconstruct these uh, metastases. But if that does uh, serve as an indication, then we typically reattach the greater trochanteric fragment with a cable grip system, and we typically use a bipolar system to improve the stability of that implant. Instability of a proximal femur with dislocations of the hip has been one of the challenges in the past. 
a bipolar component can help, and, and a reattachment of the greater trochanter is an essential functional uh, element of that reconstruction. And those patients can recover within 10 to 12 weeks uh, with a good procedure, and most of them get radiation therapy, but not always. Here's an example of a 60-year-old man with left knee pain, was treated here, he was a smoker, had a questionable mass in both his lung and his kidney, had a proximal femoral lesion that uh, was MR'd, and a very reasonable uh, choice for putting an intratrochanteric device into that proximal femur with one essential mistake, which was the lack of a biopsy. The lack of a biopsy is a critical failure to touch first base and to make assumptions which will doom you to a serious scenario. This particular patient had a chondrosarcoma. His entire femur was contaminated, and in those scenarios, they are likely to have an amputation uh, at the level of the hip, which is a pretty serious uh, situation to deal with. So beware of your status of the diagnosis with these patients, and don't forget to touch first base when it comes to diagnostic issues. A rod through a sarcoma uh, reminds us about whether every patient has a diagnosis. And if you get into the operating room and start to be distracted by scenarios in the operating room or the procedure that you're the larger part of the procedure, such as a reconstructive rod or a hemiarthroplasty, do not forget the, the fact that you do or do not have a biopsy that proves the diagnosis. Try to remember whether that diagnosis involves metastatic disease or the skeleton. The one time you don't need to do a biopsy in a patient like this is in the patient who has previous record and a history of multiple bony metastases. That's a patient that doesn't need a biopsy, but everybody else needs a biopsy before they have a rod or an implant put through a lesion. And the frozen section needs to be recognized. We have 10 cases of rods through chondrosarcomas and osteosarcomas in the last 15 years. It's not that uncommon. Each one of those cases involves uh, an amputation, and many of them uh, had a poor prognosis. The vast majority of patients involved chondrosarcoma and required an amputation. They all had adequate imaging, which did not distinguish chondrosarcoma from metastases. And in fact, we had two graduates from our own program that uh, cared for the patients in 10 of these cases. So even our own colleagues are challenged by this uh, particular scenario. So beware. Mid-shaft of the femur is the classic location for a locked rod, the preferred uh, rod in my practice is a rod that has uh, two screws proximally and two screws distally. It's a very, very efficient way to reconstruct these patients. There are some scenarios. If you look carefully uh, at uh, the x-ray on the right, you can see the cement mass is, is uh, protruding outside of the lesion, and a cement uh, mass was used to fill a, a defect in the mid-shaft of the femur, which shows a failure to take good x-rays before the case is completed. Uh, do not prefer a plate for mid-shaft lesions. A plate is a reasonable alternative for juxtarticular reconstructions of either the distal femur or the proximal femur. It is, in many cases, of the upper extremity a preferred uh, fixation, especially in the distal humerus. But as a general rule, the fixation provided by even a locking plate is not comparable to what you achieve with a well-placed interlocked rod. It has a longer OR time and a larger exposure involved. In the distal femur, we have the addition of the uh, retrograde rod in addition to an anti-grade rod, which becomes an issue in the distal femur. Again, I would apply a five centimeter rule. Five centimeters from the notch is the indication for probably considering a retrograde uh, implant. If you take the example of this case on the left with a large metastatic lesion, perhaps you could consider, uh, here's the x-rays for that, a CT in the middle and an MR to, to the right of that consider a plate for that particular uh, metastasis, except that this is also not a metastasis. It's another chondrosarcoma. If you forgot first base again, you're in the dugout for a while now. Retrograde rods are extremely valuable in reconstructing patients. Here's a 23-year-old that I did a few weeks ago with a big lesion with a large soft tissue mass associated with it who's doing very poorly. And I thought perhaps a retrograde rod would be a smaller surgical procedure than an anti-grade rod, a retrograde rod was used, and I was very impressed with their pain relief, which was almost immediate for even this difficult scenario. So retrograde rods have been a huge uh, addition to the armamentarium and femoral reconstructions. Lastly, the resection of the distal femur is also a good procedure, especially if you can avoid radiation therapy for distal femoral lesions. Uh, 
It's a procedure that again requires 10 or 12 weeks of recovery. The uh, biomechanics for these implants has improved dramatically in the last uh, four to five years. Routinely, actually, we use uncemented implants, although we may uh, alter that with uh, metastatic disease with cemented implants. And the purchase and fixation power of these uncemented implants rivals the baby grand piano uh, scenario of uh, not being able to uh, dislodge the implants, even in the uh, biomechanics lab, in some work that we've done in the last three years with uncemented implants. The fixation is impressive. So in conclusion, I'd say this is absolutely part of general orthopedics, unless you're going to hone your practice down to only a very small part of sports medicine or total joints or some other scenario. This is going to be part of your practice, and you can use the trauma skills you've learned at Harborview to help you with making decisions about these patients. The volumes are high. About 25% of the 20 to 25% of those 1 million patients will need to have some surgical issues come up with an orthopedic surgeon with their metastatic disease. They're challenging. The disease status is a very challenging scenario that you need to keep focused on. Communications are very challenging. And always consider, with regards to communications, the challenge of the relative risk. Relative risk is the risk of dealing with the relatives, and their expectations can be variable and unpredictable, and you need to be very close to the relatives that are in the clinic with the patients and sometimes to the relatives that are not in the clinic with the patients. I've avoided some of the awkward communication issues by handicapping every procedure that I do. And if we're in the 50-50 range of life, the patients need to, and their families need to understand that. It's not a 90% procedure like a total hip. So the typical scenario for these patients at best is 70 to 80% uh, good results. My friend Penelope, uh, who lives uh, in the uh, great city of Walla Walla, struggled with a femoral rod for several years. I had a chat with her the other day. She's a very intelligent woman dealing with uh, metastatic disease and had needed several procedures to reconstruct her femoral rod. She was extremely grateful to have that finally uh, reconstructed. It's an incredibly rewarding uh, procedure for these patients. And, and uh, this is a very sophisticated woman. She said, I think about you every day, Chappie, because of the success of that femoral uh, revision procedure, which resolved her pain and allowed her to do the things she, activity things she likes to do in life. So don't forget to touch first base. It's, a, it's an agonizing extra hour in the OR if you need to do a biopsy. It takes at least a half an hour to get an answer from the pathologist. Sometimes you don't get an answer at all, and sometimes the biopsy result is ignored. Be very careful about your diligence with regards to that issue. Now we're going to show you a couple of cases uh, for discussion. First one is uh, the case that we started the presentation with. So, as you might recall, it's a 45-year-old woman. She has a diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer with a known diagnosis of metastatic bone disease, and she comes with right arm pain. Her x-rays, both AP and lateral views, show a relatively poorly defined lytic lesion in the distal humeral diaphysis sneaking into the metaphysis. In particular, posteriorly, but also anteriorly, there's a fair bit of cortical destruction. And in addition, what may not project as well is that there's also a lesion in roughly the mid-shaft uh, area of uh, her humerus. So as is usually the case for the upper extremity lesions, she gets a course of radiation treatment. She also has a course of bracing. Both of these are ineffective, and she comes with essentially pain that is preventing her from using her dominant extremity for her activities of daily living. So treatment options would certainly include continued non-operative treatment, excising those lesions and doing a big tumor type reconstruction, intramedullary nail, cement plate reconstruction, any other options people can think of or should we, Dr. Chapman? Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for great uh, lectures. Uh, can you address the, uh, I'm gonna ask a question to you, uh, three, sure. maybe all three, uh, the three of you can come up there. Um, uh, in the spine world, radiation and the timing of radiation to surgery is a very big decision-making factor for us. So can you three address the uh, timely and the quantity relation of radiation therapy and the type of surgery that you uh, will consider? Again, here that uh, radiation therapy was applied may very much mm -hmm. influence my decision-making in the surgery. Excellent question. And I think it depends a lot, as you alluded to, on, on the doses that they've used. So for example, 
Um, when radiation is used for neoadjuvant treatment and soft tissue sarcoma, higher doses generally wait four to six weeks uh, before operating on those patients. In the metastatic setting, they're usually using lower doses. And so I don't think there is quite firm rules as far as how long to wait between the end of radiation and surgery. Um, from my short experience to date, what I like to do is to give the radiation a chance to work to really assess the response to it, particularly in the upper extremity where though you don't want the, the limb to fracture, if it does, it's not as catastrophic as it is around the hip. And so usually that's a few weeks to, to assess the response of the patient to radiation. And I think by that time, any issues related to skin or other soft tissues and operating through those are by and large not a major consideration as far as being able to proceed with um, whatever surgical option you choose. So that's a great question. Um, Darren actually is a little bit of an expert at that because uh, uh, Toronto pioneered radiation therapy up front for surgery and I think that uh, was associated with a higher incidence of wound complications and uh, usually you can predict that by what the skin looks like at the conclusion of the radiation therapy treatment. If the skin looks really bad and it had a big epidermolysis burn and it needed to recover a long time, then you need to delay your procedure. Uh, if they don't have a big uh, significant burn associated near the end of the radiation therapy, then the surgery can happen within two to four weeks at the conclusion of the radiation therapy. If it's conventional radiation therapy, that's not an unusual scenario. Um, the routine for us is usually a wait of about three to four weeks. Uh, and we, are, we will delay that if we're concerned about what the skin looks like. And higher particle radiation therapy is a very difficult and cautious uh, timeout scenario. So that would be with um, protons or with neutrons. Be very, very careful about operating on patients who have had higher energy radiation therapy because uh, the complications in surgery with bleeding, et cetera, et cetera, are much more serious than that. But for a con conventional radiation therapy, it's a matter of what the skin looks like and how the wound's going to heal and we can address that uh, by how the patient did during the course of therapy and what they look like uh, several weeks after. The first case we can do kind of a, a vote system for treating uh, that lesion. So just to review the x-rays, of have a destructive lytic lesion in the distal humeral diaphysis sneaking into the metaphysis as well as another smaller lesion not affecting the cortex but definitely present in the mid-shaft region. And this is a patient with an established diagnosis of metastatic bone disease. So any option or any votes for continued non-operative treatment? No? No takers? Okay. Uh, how about excision in a tumor type prosthetic reconstruction? Takers? Okay. So we've got one choice for that. Intramedullary nail fixation. Got a few more choices. And then cement plate reconstruction. Okay, so that's the majority, so that's good. Any questions about the options or, you know, relative advantages, disadvantages to any of those? Radial nerve function um, down the line after these procedures, is there any comparative literature suggesting who comes out more functional for whatever lifespan they retain post-op? Right, but it's comparing the nail and the plate? Or any of the four that you would consider. Okay, I mean, mo most of the studies on this is predominantly intramedullary nail. And most of the studies don't demonstrate a very large issue with radial nerve uh, dysfunction postoperatively. Uh, there's a couple of studies of the cement plate fixation method. And the first study that I showed, that larger series of 60 odd patients, that's from Toronto where it's a pretty established technique. They had very few radial nerve issues. The other study that compared IM nail and plate fixation, the big complication with the plate fixation was radial nerve palsy in four out of 20 patients. And whether that's a learning curve issue in that particular paper, because that centered just not quite as high a volume with that technique, it's hard to say. But there aren't any good functional comparative studies for any of these methods. Was that with cement as well? Because that yes. that's been shown to bake the nerve in some reconstructions. And that comes back to the technical point about it, because you know, in the center where it's done more, in Toronto where I learned to do it, you, know, you go and dissect out the whole nerve, completely protect it, the cement goes in and it's all very controlled and there's no leakage of cement around, the nerve's protected the whole time. But certainly you're absolutely right, if enough care is not taken around the nerve, 
and there's cement being placed in the bone adjacent to the nerve, that can be a definite issue. And last question, does XRT have any impact on the nerve function? Um, also a good question. So there can be some direct effects from radiation on neurologic function. Typically at the doses used for metastatic disease, it's not, not a big issue. And also because of the lower doses, fibrosis in the soft tissues um, at the area radiated isn't as big of an issue, which could come up just in the dissection of, of any critical structures around the location. So this patient was treated with uh, curatage of the lesions, cement plate reconstruction, um, trying to protect as much of the bone as possible. So obviously some limitations going proximally with, with the radial nerve, but this patient, radial nerve function is fine. Pain control, uh, very good after the initial couple of days and returned to using the extremity for activities of daily living uh, pretty quickly postoperatively. So one more question. First of all, what approach was used here? Uh, and was this patient allowed immediate full weight bearing on that extremity? Right, so it's a posterior approach with a tricep splitting type approach to get as much access as possible, and yes, immediate weight bearing postoperatively. You tried to avoid any form of olecranon osteotomy? Yes, yes. Uh, the second question again, uh, going back to the radiation is, breast uh, cancer is usually a more radiosensitive tumor. How long, if you decide to go for radiation therapy, would you want to wait until you could kind of convert that lesion, or could you convert that lesion to a more osteoblastic kind of a uh, lesion and possibly uh, provide the patient with more pain relief? So convert it just with the radiation with, Just with radiation, yeah. I'm not sure that there's any good guidelines on how long to wait to see. I mean, again, from, from what I've seen and, and done, it's more a matter of giving a few, at least a few weeks after the radiation is complete to assess the response and to see if whatever improvement there may have been is sufficient for the patient to resume whatever regular activities that, that they have. I don't know that converting it to more of an osteoblastic situation is going to push uh, the decision making one way or another between addressing it surgically or not it would more be on a symptomatic basis. I just want to say again, if, if, uh, they've had radiation therapy. This distal segment of the humerus can be entirely uh, dead, necrotic, and, uh, and getting it to heal in here is very difficult. I, this is a great plate, this condylar plate, because you can get it down on the condyles, and you've done this laterally but not medially. And uh, pre prior to these condylar plates, we used reconstruction plates. And getting this fixation down here distally is typical scenario for a middle-aged uh, woman with breast cancer. And they can have multiple, multiple failures, end up with a gross non-union that never heals, or with an extremity that's so painful that maybe even amputation becomes a consideration. So this is a very, very serious scenario if these reconstructions don't work the first time or two. When you're treating humeral metastases, I think often they end up being myeloma and, and there's even a predilection for a renal cell to metastasize there. So uh, what role does preoperative embolization have for you? And when you're doing these open versus uh, intermedullary nailing, is there, uh, does the presence of one of these really vascular lesions uh, change what approach you use? For renal cell, um, there's essentially two scenarios, a patient with a late presenting isolated metastasis, which as Josh was talking about earlier, is a situation you might consider excising the lesion and treating it almost as though it were a sarcoma because the survival can be better, or multiple bony mets or a single bone met with, with other visceral metastases. Those situations are palliative, um, and in either circumstance, because of the vascular nature of renal cell metastases, I think that those should all get preoperative uh, angiographic embolization um, before any surgical procedure, be it excision or, or um, cement plate, IM nail, closed, open, either way. For myeloma, typically what I've been taught to do and done is to embolize the pelvic lesions, but the extremity lesions to, to just go ahead and, and deal with those uh, surgically uh, without embolization. Um, I think one of the big keys to doing the cement plate reconstructions, or maybe the two big keys, is one is to cure out as, cure out as much of that tumor as possible, because one of the issues that can certainly arise is that there's local disease progression, which leads to further mechanical problems and failure. 
And as Dr. Conrad was alluding to, if these fail, it can be a really big, difficult problem to deal with. And the other is trying to get as much cement into that defect and even into some of the normal adjacent bone as possible, because that's also going to really increase the fixation strength that, that you have. So this patient's a 75-year-old with metastatic lung cancer, multiple bony metastases, has a lesion in the proximal humeral diaphysis, uh, proceeding into the metaphysis and even up into the epiphysis. It's a destructive lesion, cortical erosion, no response to radiation treatment. And because of the size and location, um, the choice for him was uh, excision and a prosthetic reconstruction. And then another case, and then we'll have more discussion for a femoral case. It's a 57-year-old male with metastatic esophageal carcinoma. Um, only skeletal met is a lesion in the right humerus. It's treated with bracing for several months with no improvement. And these are his x-rays. Pretty dire situation. Treatment choices, continued non-operative treatment, although that's failed over several months. Radiation treatment's probably not going to be effective in, in restoring sufficient bone integrity. You could look at a prosthetic reconstruction, intramedullary nail, or a cement plate type of reconstruction. And as you're probably seeing what my bias is, uh, this guy got treated with re cement reconstruction of his, of his humerus. So that should hopefully leave enough time to discuss a, a peritrochanteric lesion in a bit more detail. So this patient's a 75-year-old female. Previous renal, uh, renal cell cancer, four or five years before she presents with right hip pain. Full workup shows there's no other um, metastatic lesions, either skeletal or visceral, and that's her x-ray. This is actually the same x-ray that, that Josh went through the murals criteria on. So the score is 11, which is over the threshold for, for fixation. And so I think the choices <laughs> for her would probably, most people would say, intramedullary nail placement, um, you could throw a cement plate in there, but I think intramedullary nail would probably be the biggest choice for, for dealing with this lesion, or uh, excising it and doing a type of prosthetic reconstruction. Dr. Chow. Darren, I have a question again. Um, you've addressed the local uh, tumor disease severity. Can you address the systematic tumor burden a little bit? Is that something that uh, enters your decision making as you're weighing surgical options? Do you use a Karnofsky index or something like that to kind of help you in terms of looking at a more palliative rod fixation versus a larger uh, invasive open mm -hmm. procedure? Um, so excellent, excellent question and a very important consideration. And I don't think we have any really great skills to definitively do this with, with the different types of surgeries that are available. And so as best we can do, we try to predict what their anticipated survival is, what the anticipated recovery from the surgery is and propose a, a surgery that's going to have a rehab period less than the anticipated survival so that the patient will experience some benefit from whatever it is that we're doing. And so the same lesion, um, for example, a peritrochanteric lesion may be treated with an intramedullary nail for a patient with a anticipated short survival, and it may be treated in a different method for the same radiographic lesion, but in a patient with a longer survival. And I don't think there's really any great algorithms for deciding uh, between those choices. It's very much um, a discussion with the family and trying to sort out anticipated prognoses. Darren, what about the opposite scenario of a patient with this as an isolated lesion and their health is quite good, I mean, in terms of their cancer status, they're really doing quite well, and they say they have no pain at all, and they have a lesion with co significant cortical um, compromise on it. Uh, you just tell them, you think the risk is too great to not do a rod? Uh, if they don't have pain, how do you solve that problem where they're not having pain and you tell them they need a right. rod just because of the x-rays? Well, I think is the first part, is, as you talked about in your section, was communication is the absolute key to the whole situation. If there's a patient with an anticipated long survival who has a lesion in a high-risk area, such as the peritrochanteric region, but they don't have pain and there are a patient that's reliable and you can talk to them, I would certainly discuss with them radiation treatment, protected weight bearing, and very careful follow-up if I was pretty confident that if they noticed any change in their pain pattern that they would get in touch with us right away so that we could readdress things. If on the other hand the same patient had the same lesion with the only difference being they weren't so reliable, I might not want to trust them so much to protect their weight bearing and to get back in touch right away if there was 
any change in their pain and might recommend some form of prophylactic stabilization off the bat. I think the key to all of this, as you discussed, is really communicating with the patient and the family what the various options are. In a lot of circumstances, there seem to be a lot of right answers, and it's about trying to find the best answer for that particular situation and that particular patient and their family. So this lesion, 75-year-old patient, isolated renal cell mat. It's confirmed to be a renal cell mat, so we don't have to worry about it being something else. It's their only lesion. They're four years out from, from their primary renal cancer, which was treated with a nephrectomy. Treatment options, I think we could boil down to intramedullary nail or some form of a prosthetic reconstruction. So votes for an IM nail. Lots of votes for an IM nail. Votes for some form of an excision in a prosthetic reconstruction. Okay. Um, maybe to ask some questions to everyone. For people doing an IM nail, any other adjuvant treatments that they put with it besides just putting in the nail? Can you excise the lesion concomitantly? Yeah. So, I mean, you could pass a nail or, you know, pass the guide wire, deal with the lesion, and then put the nail over top of the guide wire. That would be an option. And you'd have an option to put cement with that if, if one chose to. And then how about radiating that lesion, whether you place cement or not, after the fixation? Okay. So as this case unfolds, this patient um, had an intramedullary nail placed, no perioperative complications, felt much better afterwards, and then represented eight months later. Um, their renal cancer hadn't progressed all that much. There's no new um, detectable metastases. And the problem that has happened here is that the local lesion has continued to grow. There wasn't any adjuvant treatment um, for that lesion at the time, wasn't curated out, no radiation, and over time with weight bearing, as you can see, the nails failed, the lesion has increased and now fractured. Can you and your co-lecturers address the um, uh, various uh, survivals of uh, metastatic lesions in the long bones, especially in the metaphysis and diaphysis? It seems that I remember that when we did, uh, without any resection of the uh, lesions, uh, reamings and the nail placements, a lot of these metastases can somehow heal. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, in a renal cell cancer, as we saw here, the disease uh, progressed. So are there some metastases which, due to the trauma of reaming and nailing, uh, somehow have an impetus to heal versus others that just uh, are not <coughs> affected by surgical trauma? Right. I, I'm not sure that there's any lesions that, um, without any adjuvant treatment, we could rely on to heal. And so the adage that I've always been taught and tried to follow is that you know, the tumor that's there just wants to grow. And if it were to regress or heal, that would be an added, added bonus, but not to rely on that because it's not predictable enough to know. Um, the opposite situation with the renal cell carcinomas, I think, is true. So that's this situation. And though I don't think an intramedullary nail is at all an unreasonable choice, I think something has to be done locally at the site to try to prevent um, local progression. And that was the issue here, not so much that an intramedullary nail was used, but that in this particular case, there was no adjuvant treatment done for the lesion itself, no curatage of it, and no radiation. And so the lesion that was there just continued to grow. And because the patient's survival turns out to be quite good, they've survived an additional eight months to, to the point that this has happened. The mechanical problems with that tumor progression have, have overwhelmed the nail's ability to withstand that. And there's been failure of it, which now requires revision. So there was so, no radiation therapy? No. So this was something that um, needed revision. So options at this point could, I suppose, radiate it, although that's not going to address the mechanical problems. So what was done was the nail was removed and uh, calcar replacing um, hemiarthroplasty stem was placed for that patient. The one thing with this case, uh, I may have missed it, but there was no other disease at all, right? No. Not at, not at the initial. Isolated renal cells. So I'm assuming that, uh, that we didn't that treat this, is that right? That's right. No, this is a case for Because the you can make a strong argument just for a systemic control also to, to yes. resect yes. that the first time. So going, going back to that study from JBGS from about five years ago, in this scenario of a late presenting isolated renal cell met, the survival can be expected to be upwards of 30, 35 percent. And so the discussion with the patient and the family certainly could be along the lines of a much bigger operation up front to resect the lesion and, and treat it with a bigger reconstruction, not 
so much for a cure per se, but kind of a much more definitive local control option. So we have, our philosophy has clearly migrated in the last five or 10 years for renal cells. The number one indication for a resection would be an isolated renal cell apropos to your comments. So I think we would discuss, the problem with this is the subtrochanteric, so it's a little bit bigger resection, but it's still a straightforward resection. And as a general rule now, we would probably do a resection for that and not do the rod because renal cell loves to recur. It's very radio resistant. <coughs> the survival, as Jens asked, survival is a big issue. And all the, although the survival for renal cell in the studies is not much beyond 20 to 30 months, I have a lot of patients with isolated bony mets with renal cell who have clearly survived four or five years. So it's a good operation for an isolated. It's the number one indication for resection for an isolated bony metastasis. Another question that Jens asked, which is a really good question, is how do you evaluate disease, sort of decisions about disease, good disease versus bad disease? Uh, there's three really bad survival diseases, mean survival, and that is lung, myeloma, and melanoma, um, and then breast, prostate, and the others are intermediate. And we assess patients for their health for a procedure uh, as an orthopedic oncologist, generally by staging their lung with a CT. If they don't have significant lung metastasis, it's not going to impede their uh, respiration issues uh, perioperatively. That's an indication for doing the procedure. If their survival is greater than three months, we will clearly do a rod procedure. Uh, resection is more controversial because it takes almost three months to recover from a resection. And we always make sure they have adequate platelets and blood counts with regards to bone marrow involvement. And we are a little bit attuned to hypercalcemia because it's so incredibly subtle and related sometimes with the renal cell and myeloma and some of the other tumors. So those are the systemic issues we go through for making a decision about a particular patient <coughs> with a particular diagnosis. I have one more very controversial question. If you have a patient with a more anticipated long-term survival, and you really want to have bone healing. Has bone morphogenic protein had any role in your literature? That is so, controversial. <laughs> yeah, just to bring that up, uh, is there anything published in that, and what would be the anticipated uh, ill effects of placing BMP into this uh, kind of a tumor environment? Right. I mean, I don't, I don't know of any literature on it specifically in metastatic disease. The concern, of course, is, is any um, tumorogenesis potential of placing BMP in a site that's already got... Um, malignant disease, although I'm, as far as I'm aware, it's more of a theoretical concern in the setting of metastatic disease than anything else. And I, again, I think if we're looking at doing something surgically, I'd go back to the principles of uh, choosing a procedure that, as best you can predict, is going to have one, one operation and the bone is no longer going to need any further surgery. They're going to be able to use the extremity right away, meaning you're going to do a reconstruction that is going to have immediate stability for the weight-bearing demands of that, that bone and doing something where you're relying on, on healing to occur um, is probably something that you're not going to let the patients get back to weight-bearing right away. So if the anticipated survival was going to be longer for the particular disease, I think my approach would be to look more at excising it and doing some type of reconstruction as opposed to doing something to try to deal with the lesion locally and get the bone to heal. We don't generally use it. We, I'm not aware of, uh, of a disastrous scenario. We'd be most concerned about osteogenic uh, kind of tumors, and it's just not something that we currently are in the practice of using. Do you have any other comments, Howard, on that? One other technical uh, question. Uh, when you resected this lesion and reconstructed it, uh, just for everybody who may be doing these in their practice someday, when you are not saving a wafer of the trochanter, how are you reattaching the abductors? Uh, so this... Uh, particular case um, in taking out the nail we actually did an osteotomy just on the lateral edge of the nail through the troch to have that bone that was tied back on if there isn't anything uh, any bone that's salvageable um, I would probably just try to if there's su sufficient tendon to be able to get a grip with some mersaline tapes and tie that onto a prosthesis do that I mean in that scenario I think it's into the realm of very difficult abductor reconstruction there's not a lot of great choices I mean even Tying an osteotomized piece of bone on to the prosthesis with mersaline tape is kind of a do what you can situation, and you're not expecting it's going to be perfect. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>